everyone, and welcome to the second installment of People and Pollinators Action Network's 2023 webinar series. Um, if this is your first time in one of our webinars, we host one every month, bringing you experts on different topics related to pollinator, ecosystem, and human health. So today's webinar will be on permaculture, as you all know, specifically thinking about how we can build healthy ecosystems that include people. Very briefly, a little bit about People and Pollinators Action Network. We are a nonprofit based in Colorado's Front Range with a focus on the intersection of pollinator and human health. We work a lot on legislative advocacy, education and outreach, and volunteer-based community activism, all around the larger goal of protecting people and pollinators. There are obviously a lot of reasons to do this work, but one of my favorite fast facts is that pollinators make possible one out of every three bites of food we eat, Without them, our food production systems, not to mention our broader natural, e natural ecosystems, would collapse. This year, we're also piloting something a little bit new by assigning each month a loose theme connected to our mission. This month's theme is looking at viable alternatives to currently flawed systems. Some alternatives we're exploring include changes to pesticide laws at the legislative level, transforming landscapes from traditional turf and invasives to more native and pollinator friendly beds. And of course, looking at more sustainable and less pesticide intensive agricultural alternatives like permaculture. So helping us delve into this huge topic of permaculture is our speaker today, Amy skeins Wolf. Amy began her career studying cultural anthropology at Middlebury College, after which she transitioned to organic farming, serving on the board of Eco Village Charlottesville and then working at Harlequin's Gardens just down the road in Boulder. Amy also founded and ran an ecological landscaping company and worked and volunteered with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. She is now the lead facilitator with Boulder Permaculture, as well as a permaculture homesteader, and serves as the director of research at Drylands Agroecology Research. Now, right before I turn it over to Amy here, I just want to remind everyone to please stay muted for the duration of the webinar and instead leave any questions you might have for Amy in the chat. I will be helping to moderate these at the end, time permitting. Um, this discussion will also be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel after the session for those of you wanting to revisit anything. Um, and also, if you're interested in getting more involved with people and pollinators, please consider signing up to volunteer or donating to support our work. You can find lots more information and resources at our website, www.peopleandpollinators.org, on our social media channels, at People and Pollinators, or feel free to reach out to us directly at info at peopleandpollinators.org. I will also leave the links to volunteer and donate in the chat. And with that, I'd like to welcome Amy skeins -Wolf. Wonderful, thank you so much for having me here today. Let me just go ahead and share this screen. Um, where is... Alrighty. Um, amazing. So I just figured I'd put this quote up to begin with from Bill Mollison, who is credited with kind of founding permaculture, and we'll talk about that story in a bit. But though the problems of the world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. Um, so just some food for thought as we go through this. And I guess I'll start here by just introducing myself and my story a little bit more. Um, I actually... My studies in cultural anthropology were what inspired this whole journey. And as I was doing that, that um, undergrad, I just started having this feeling like, wow, the human trajectory doesn't look too good. <laughs> and as I understood more about it, I realized how much the human story has always been connected to how we get our food. And that's what inspired me to start farming. And even after five years in the kind of organic vegetable farming world, I still had this lingering feeling that something wasn't quite right about what we were doing. And I literally one winter was, was woofing or volunteering at this farm. There was a huge snowstorm. I had nothing to do. And I found this book, Intro to Permaculture by Bill Mollison in the bookshelf. And it felt like this was really the beginning of an answer to everything I'd been wondering about. So that's how I came across permaculture. Have been fortunate enough to do many things since. Um, but just to reiterate what Nicole shared at the beginning, the three things I'm really involved with now that I'll reference throughout this 
are um, one, I'm one of the teachers with Boulder Permaculture. I was actually lucky enough to take this permaculture course in 2018 when I moved back to Colorado. Amazing way to connect with humans in the ecosystem. I also work with Drylands Agroecology Research, and I'll tell you all a little bit more of that story um, as we go. And then the Niwot Homestead is the personal homestead project that I have. And I actually connected with these folks on Nextdoor three years ago now, um, live up the road from me, were willing to let me use their land. And this whole project has grown in some really interesting ways. So just to contextualize that a little bit. Um, the first question though, that I wanna to pose to us here is what is permaculture? And before we answer that, I'm just gonna flash up a few pictures of permaculture sites from around the world and see what patterns you're noticing as we go through these. And if you'd like, feel free to stick those in the chat box too, so we can discuss. And apologies if a couple of these are a little blurry, I'm realizing now. Um, but this is actually in Colorado at high altitude near Basalt, Colorado, Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute. This is New Forest Farm in Wisconsin. It's a 110 acre permaculture farm. Limestone permaculture farm in Australia, slightly smaller scale here. The grow house in Denver, which unfortunately isn't around anymore, but maybe some of you got to visit that while it was. Very small scale example from Ohio. And then Desert of Jordan, Jeff Lawton, who's part of the Greening the Desert project. So I'm curious here if people just want to stick in the chat, what patterns stood out to you? Are there any patterns or observations between these sites? I'll give people a minute here if anyone wants to respond. Diversity of species, diversity of crops, plants living together, human made, they aren't monocultures. Amazing. So one of the things that we see a lot is that this isn't a monoculture. We're seeing diversity, we're seeing layers. I think the human made observation is a, a really important point and we'll talk about that as we go, but these aren't wild landscapes, but they look kind of like wild landscapes um, and they're full. So before we get to a definition, I'm just gonna go on what may feel like a little bit of a tangent here, but I promise this is relevant to the whole story. And just in case anyone needs this clarification, an annual is a plant that lives out its whole life cycle in a single year. So a lot of our vegetables, sunflowers, um, grow, set, seed, die. A perennial is a plant that lives for more than two years. So whether that's trees, shrubs, things like the echinacea that die back but come back the next year. So in nature, we all have disturbance events. This happens, it's always happened. We're seeing a lot of them lately. But what is the first type of plant that we usually come see come back after these disturbance events? And feel free to type this as well. I'm seeing grass, weeds, weeds, yep. The plants that come back right away are plants we call weeds and often we don't like these plants very much <laughs> in today's world, but weeds are really, really good at getting to disturbed sites fast, covering them fast, reproducing fast, setting a ton of seed and planting themselves again. All natural ecosystems have weeds, not always invasive non-native weeds, but these annual colonizing plants. And in a natural ecosystem, as they slowly die back and die to the ground, they create the right conditions for the next layer of plants to emerge. And as somebody said before, this is usually grass, but not necessarily annual grass, more perennial grasses, wildflowers, forbs. And if there's enough water and there aren't certain disturbances like livestock grazing, we may progress into something that looks a little bit more shrubby kind of a shrubby woodland, open space, still grass in the mix. And if there's still more water, we might progress to a softwood forest. And with yet more water, we might progress into something that looks like this in Colorado, but in other climates could be a hardwood forest, a rainforest. Basically what we just walked through is ecological succession. And what's really cool about living in Colorado actually is if you just walk west, from the plains, you're basically walking right up that ecological succession grade, which is really cool. But the question I have for you is where do our food crops today fit into this picture? 
which category are they in? And feel free to type the answer here again. I'm seeing they don't, I'm seeing annuals. So you all, 90% of the food that we eat today descended from weeds. We are eating weeds. What is really important about that is what's true of this ecosystem and this one and this one and even this one is once it reaches this kind of stable climax ecosystem, there's some flux of species over time, but you have this relatively stable plant community that's sequestering carbon, building soil fertility, creating habitat, providing all these useful functions. That's not true of this weed community at all. And so what we're essentially doing is in order to grow these annual weed plants for our food, we have to redisturb. oh yeah, that's the conclusion. We have to redisturb our soil every single year. And that's why our agricultural systems look a lot like this. Our plants are actually adapted for that. Um, and just as a fun fact from my cultural anthropology background, if you look at the ratios in nature of annual to perennial plants, it's about 10% annual to 90% perennial. Today, we eat 90% annual foods and 10% perennial foods. Our hunter-gatherer ancestors flipped that ratio on its head. They ate 10% annuals, 90% perennials, same ratio you find in nature. So really this sums up in a way, the problem with our food systems today is that we're just stuck here. We're never progressing to the ecosystem types that actually build fertility and habitat and all these useful things in our ecosystems. Um, and, and that takes us really to what I consider my favorite definition of permaculture, you'll hear a lot. But permaculture is a design science that uses nature as a model for designing human systems. What does it look like? when we actually make our food systems follow this progression and look a little bit more like this with a smaller percentage in the disturbance phase. And I do wanna just mention permaculture is not all about food production. It actually is all about human design. And just as a really beautiful example of how to use nature as a model for design beyond food, I wanted to share this example. Um, so there was a scientist in Japan who had this theory that probably slime mold could actually design the Tokyo railway system better than humans could. So what he did is he took a Petri dish and he put in the middle of it, the slime mold. And then for each hub where the subway needed to stop, he put a piece of substrate, a breadcrumb type thing at exactly the right size for the relative population of that hub. And then he watched how the slime mold connected all of those dots and cross-referenced it with the railway system that was already designed, the idea being that that slime mold could actually predict the most efficient way to connect all of these dots. Um, and I also want to mention that permaculture isn't new. This word permaculture really came from Bill Mollison in the 1970s. But the way permaculture operates is the way that humans have been living on earth for pretty much all of human history until very recently. And it's the way many indigenous peoples still relate to the earth. So I see permaculture as a toolkit for those of us who have forgotten to get back to living in this way that is in relationship with the earth and according to nature's rules. So if nature is truly our inspiration and our teacher, I have that question to pose to you, what are nature's rules? Um, and, and maybe I'll just actually pause for a moment here so you can type some thoughts that you might have in that chat box and we'll give people about 30 seconds to think on that. Wonderful. So I'm seeing some amazing things coming up here. And I'm going to flip to the next slide so we can reflect on this. As permaculture designers, we ground ourselves first in these ethics of earth care, people care, and fair share, distributing the surplus. And then we have these principles that guide our design. And the reason I wanted to pose this question to you is that we don't actually need this permaculture framework to understand this. All we have to do is go observe nature 
And these rules are almost here just to help us understand how nature works so we can copy that. And I saw a few people alluding to these in their responses. Produce no waste is a big one, right? That cyclical relationship between things, there is no waste in nature. Um, I'm just gonna scroll up and see what else we put here. Change back, realistic and planable. I think that probably ties in with the small, slow solutions, which is the way that nature makes all change happen. Balance, nothing wasted. Um, great. So don't want to harp on this too much because we're actually going to go through these principles with examples from the county and what's going on here, but just wanted to really invite us to be observers of nature ourselves and, and know that we have what we need to find these answers, even without the permaculture framework. Um, our first principle, though, and arguably the most important is observe and interact. Um, there's a, a kind of expression in permaculture that often in the modern world, we spend 10% of our time observing and then 90% of our energy fixing all the problems that we created with the systems we put in place before understanding well enough how to proceed. And that permaculture flips that on its head and says spend 90% of your time observing so that when you design systems, they work really well. And because nature is our greatest teacher, the first question I always ask as an observer is what's here? What do we notice about the environment that we're in? And how can we use these ecosystems that are already thriving in Colorado as a model for designing human systems? And so let's just go through a couple of those really quick. Of course, the biggest ecosystem type here on the plains is grasslands. And it's an interesting thing. I used to work at the Ag Heritage Center um, out on Highway 66, and I used to ask kids, how do you turn grass into human food? If you're really working with this ecosystem, how do you do that? And the real only clear answer is, is through a ruminant <laughs> that's able to produce meat. And I know that a lot of livestock has gotten a bad rap lately, but one fun fact that I looked up just for the sake of it was historically the number of bison and antelope in the United States is approximately equal to the number of now cattle, goats, and sheep combined. Why that's important is because our grasslands were vital and healthy and we weren't dealing with climate change before. And now we are dealing with climate change caused by a lot of these very similar animals in very similar numbers. So what's the difference? And it really comes down to management. Um, some of you probably are familiar with Alan Savory and the Savory Institute, but just for those who aren't, Alan Savory worked in Southern Africa, and that was a question he really started posing to himself as a game warden and somebody responsible for these grasslands was, why is it that these wild animals are thriving in really high density in grassland ecosystems that are healthy, but our cattle are causing desertification? And he realized that one of the biggest driving forces that was missing and our domestic animals was predators. And what predators do is they keep all those animals bunched together and moving quickly across the landscape. So they poop and they pee and they trample and they fertilize, and then they move on and they don't come back for a long period of time. So the essence of regenerative grazing and healthy grassland management is copying that. And we're not gonna necessarily bring um, predators into our system, but at Elk Run Farm and the nonprofit I work with, we raise both cattle and sheep. And the way that we mimic that is with electric fencing that keeps them in that small confined space and moving up to daily um, to mimic that effect. And just as an example of what's possible down in the bottom there is an image of before and after Savory's work actually using cattle to regenerate land in Southern Africa. Um, I also just get excited about this. Um, there's not a lot of people growing it yet locally, but the Land Institute in Kansas has been working on developing this perennial type of wheat called Kernza by crossing annual and perennial wheats together. Traditional annual wheat has a foot deep root system. This has a 30 foot deep root system. So the drought resilience potential is huge. Gets planted once, lasts a few years, and you can graze cattle on top of it. So now we're starting to see a human system that's actually looking a little bit more like how our ecosystems looked historically. And we'll be planting this as a trial this year with the nonprofit at one of our sites. Um, we look at another ecosystem type. 
and get into forests. And we'll, we'll actually revisit this picture and this ecosystem in a second. But before we get into that, really at the essence of mimicking force is this idea of using and valuing diversity, which is also a principle in permaculture. And I wanted to start with this actual annual crop example that a lot of us are familiar with of the three sisters. And maybe if you wanna take a second, just type in that chat box, why do these three plants, corn, beans, and squash do so well together? Why does the three sisters work? So I'm hearing they all support each other. They use three different elements, interdependence, complementary nitrogen needs, right. So what we usually hear is that that corn is a living stock for pole beans to grow up. The beans are fixing nitrogen, which the corn needs. I'm seeing the shade that squash is spreading across the ground and creating kind of a living weed barrier, keeping the system cool and moist. But think about what's also happening under the ground, right? So we have the ground beneath that, you have corn that has a relatively deep root system. Then you have beans that has this shallow fibrous root system that's kind of in a mid-level. And then squash has a lateral spreading root system. So what's going on under the soil is also non-competition. What's also important about these three plants is different plant families. We have a grass, we have a legume, we have a squash, a cucurbit. Why that matters is pests often eat plants according to plant family. They're really adapted to love plants within a single family. So when you break that up, you're breaking up the pest buffet. And that's really important because you're now creating a balanced ecosystem where there will be some pests, but none of them are gonna get out of hand. And the final reason it's important is corn, bean, and squash are a pretty complete diet. And that's, again, where we get into this idea of designing systems that also meet human needs, which we'll talk about more. So if you extrapolate that, we get what we call in permaculture a guild. Taken up to a broader kind of perennial ecosystem, the idea behind a guild is that you're creating a grouping of plants that almost functions as its own micro ecosystem. All of these plants are in different niches. So you have the shrubs and the ground covers. If you looked under the soil, you'd also see a diversity of plant roots there. Um, diversity of bloom time, diversity of plant family. And just to give you an example of what that looks like, this is actually the, the food forest at my homestead, right at the entryway of it. My friend Albert here picking some apples. But under that apple tree, we have horseradish, we have a nitrogen fixing Siberian pea shrub, we have a native currant, we have wild sorrel growing all over the ground, we have some asters for fall bloom back here. And so there's this diverse collection of plants where you can imagine almost walking into a forest, but everything in it has an edible or medicinal use, and it's functioning like an ecosystem. And just to give you a little more detail, this is some of that guild kind of mapped out. When I'm designing something like this, I'm usually looking for maximum diversity in a number of different things, including the niche, the root system, the bloom time, because that supports pollinators for the whole season, the plant family, and the function. And there's one, you could, you could really go down a rabbit hole with this, and I'm such a nerd about plants, so I don't wanna hold us here too long. But one fun thing is that um, if you all eat apples, you've probably seen the little holes in them, which are caused by coddling moth larva. Well, there is a parasitic wasp that parasitizes that larva, and that wasp is attracted to carrot family plants with the big umble flower, right? And so I had heard that for years, that if you plant carrot family plants under your apple trees, you won't have a problem with holes in your apples. One year, two years ago now, we had that bumper crop of fruit. Um, and I, I accidentally let a bunch of wild carrots take over my vegetable garden, mostly out of neglect, but they were under these old apple trees. There was not a single hole in those apples. Apple trees on the other side of the property covered in holes. So it was a really interesting, just living experiment in that principle. Um, and again, this idea in permaculture that when we look at pests, our solutions are not subtractive. We're not trying to eradicate the pest, they're additive. We're trying to add something to the system that will bring the whole ecosystem into greater balance. 
And just a couple of other examples of guilds at work. Elk Run Farm is the pilot farm for the nonprofit I work with, and this is a picture of their forest garden. They have annuals filling the holes until the perennials will grow over and shade them out, so almost following that ecological succession pattern. But also here, it looks like we have gooseberries. I think that's lemon balm. It's hard to tell in this picture. We have some valerian. Um, Benevolence Orchard is a wonderful site that some of you may have been to on J Road, also established with this logic. And I just want to also invite that you can get into all the science of plant families and root types, but you can also just walk into nature and ask what plants are growing together and how can I take that and use it as a model for what I'm growing. So I guess I'll pose that as a question to you too. I think a lot of us are familiar with these type of riparian ecosystems. What is the understory of that cottonwood? What are some of the plants you would find there? Dandelions, absolutely. You don't even have to try and plant those in your guild, they'll just appear. Poison ivy, American plum. Woods rose. Absolutely. So a couple of the plants that I see here a lot are, for example, choke cherry, and then under those American plum and our native golden currant. And I might not actually want to plant those exact plants in my food forest, but I might say, hey, choke cherry does really well here. I'm going to plant a cherry tree. And next to that, I'm going to put a golden currant because I see that does well. And so you can start taking this and using it as a model, but shifting it slightly towards the plants that maybe are a little more exciting to grow in our systems. Um, and just to, to highlight, this is actually our native golden currant. It is my personal favorite currant. Um, it's just a delicious, delicious one, big juicy berries, little tart. I'm guessing some of you may recognize this plant on the right, but it's a service berry and it's the blueberry that will actually grow in Colorado is how I like to describe it, and in wild plum. So just to highlight a few of our natives that are actually very good. Um, and then just wanted to introduce this principle of using edges, value the marginal. And one of the common examples that you hear around this is the herb spiral. This is one that I actually made way back in Virginia, but the idea is what was a pretty flat, uninteresting piece of land without a lot of variation in it, you can create this spiral shape that actually gives you a whole host of microclimates to plant now a much greater diversity of plants. So maybe in the top, you're putting things like rosemary or lavender that like the drainage and the sun. And as you go around, you're planting things that like the more moderate conditions of either morning or afternoon sun, some oregano and afternoon sun, chives maybe in the morning sun, all the way down to the bottom where you may have even something like watercress um, you can put a little catchment there. And someone's identifying the purple orac. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and in a way, that ties us into the last ecosystem type I just wanted to reference. But I pose this question sometimes of which ecosystem type in general is most productive. And people usually answer rainforests, which is true. But second to rainforest, the most productive type of ecosystem in terms of biodiversity and actual like synthesis of sunlight into living energy is the savanna, that edge between grassland and forest. And, and this is actually New Forest Farm, which is modeled entirely after the Wisconsin oak savanna. This is a close up of that large scale farm that we looked at at the beginning. It's also the inspiration for the work that my nonprofit does. Um, or the one that I work for. So I just wanted to share that story briefly because for me, it's one of the most inspiring case studies in this region. So you'll see on the top right there, Nick and Marissa who founded this project. But in 2015, Nick wanted to farm. Um, he managed with his family to get this 15 acre parcel in the foothills near Lyons. And we all wish that we had before pictures of this land, which nobody ever thought to, took, to take. Um, but this whole area, which is about 10 acres, was almost completely devegetated. Um, it was eroding, it was sloped, it was dry. There was a well on site that could irrigate less than an acre of the 15 acre property. And this was the only piece of land they could get a hold of 
and managed to get for, for Nick to farm. And he reached out to the NRCS and asked for their advice on how to restore it to a farmable state. And they literally said, there are no tools in our toolkit that we have that can help you. It would be better to find a different piece of land. So the whole thing became an experiment. And how do you regenerate deeply degraded land without water in our climate? And grounded in permaculture methodologies, what they ended up doing was digging first contour swale systems. So the idea behind a contour swale is that even on a gentle slope, water is always running off of it. And so you're gonna find that contour level line of the slope and dig a basin and a berm. So as water comes down that slope, it hits that basin, it deeply infiltrates, and then it progresses down the landscape. And you can see a picture of that in the top right here, what that looks like, even on a very gentle slope. This is a partner farm of ours, Metacarbon, and you can see the broader scale of what that looks like. And it was actually really cool because a couple years after these had been dug, they had a soil scientist out for the first time. And Brian Reed, this guy usually works with more conventional ag systems, and it was a deep drought year. And he took a water probe and he stuck it into that swale and he kept going and he kept going and it was dry and dry and suddenly it was wet. And they had hit that point where you could actually tell the water was infiltrating. And he was so blown away by that because he hadn't seen it anywhere else. Um, but after digging those swales at Elk Run Farm, they filled them with compost and mulch and then set about planting a thousand trees without any irrigation. Um, and people thought they were a little bit crazy in the beginning, <laughs> and even they expected that most of these trees would probably die, so they planted them a foot and a half apart. Four years later, we're tracking about a 79% survival rate on these trees. We've planted about 5,000 total now in other systems, and the, to the average we're looking at is about 75% survival there. And so you can get a sense of what this looks like up close. But this is a mixture of, of productive fruit trees and nitrogen fixing nurse plants. And really the excitement here is that, oh, I'll, I'll pause there. As, as these trees grow, they're kind of creating that cool shade moist microclimate that helps further rehydrate the landscape. And that within 10 years, they're producing a really viable crop, but also a habitat, sequestering carbon, all of these useful functions. And then between those swales, which you can see on either side here, they're practicing holistic rotational grazing between swales like we talked about. And what this all really comes down to is this idea of ecosystem development. The beauty of this is that if we put this all in and it is a high upfront investment, but if it's well designed, we can then step back. And if we did nothing at all, the system would continue to regenerate and regenerate and grow in the way that an ecosystem does. And if we do, engage with it even minimally, there's potential for really high yields, our projections at least, no one's doing this in this bioregion that we know of, so it's all a guess, but even conservatively, the projections around food production and what we're already observing in land regeneration are really amazing. So um, just wanted to share that as a case study of kind of using this savanna model to create ecosystems in our environment that also serve as agricultural systems. And on a much smaller scale, because I know a lot of us are working in the suburban area, I just wanted to speak to this actually using the runoff water from our hardscapes. On average, we get about 16 inches of rainfall a year, they say on the plains. If we live in a city and half of our space is taken up by roofs and hardscapes, and we then actually capture and put all of that landscape water into our landscape instead of taking it off, our annual rainfall just doubled. And we're now at 32 inches of annual rainfall, which can support a whole different type of ecosystem even without irrigation, if we put it on our landscapes and turn our landscapes into a living sponge. My favorite story around this came from Brad Lancaster in Tucson, Arizona. I'm sure some of you have heard of him, but he noticed all of this stormwater rushing down the street in storm events. And he's like, you know, I, I wanna use that water. I'm gonna take it. So he cut his curb and he created a rain garden so that water would run right into his yard instead. And he got a big fat fine for it from the city. But he had this beautiful oasis growing in what is a very dry climate. And a couple of years later, the city came knocking and they said, hey, actually, can we pay you to, to 
consult on how to do this because it was such an effective solution. And it's an effective solution partly because it's only legal to catch 110 gallons of rainwater in a rain barrel from your roof. That is so much less than comes out in an average rainstorm, but it's perfectly legal to store that in your soil. So turning your soil into a living sponge. Just to touch on another principle here of produce no waste, which I know a lot of you mentioned in the beginning. The other question for you is where is nature's compost pile? Where does nature make a compost pile? And you can type this out. I'm seeing everywhere, under and around trees, underground, grasslands, where the wind blows it. So in one way, the answer to this is everywhere. There's always organic matter falling and decomposing in place in natural systems. On the other hand, nature very, very rarely heaps a bunch of stuff into a big steaming pile that's a story to high and does this kind of hot composting that we're used to. And we like that composting for sure because it gets hot enough to kill weed seed and pathogens and it's quick. But in a way, we're using a lot of energy to haul all the material to the compost pile, haul it back, spread it. And I can tell you in the center of that 160 degree compost pile, the community of life looks very different to the living community that's under soil at any one time. And so one technique in permaculture that we use is called lasagna mulching. It's basically building compost in place that mimics what's happening in a forest but on a much faster time scale. So we're building soil rapidly. And this is actually the food forest at my homestead that we showed an example of earlier, way before we planted any of that. We put down a layer of horse manure that had just started hot composting to kill weed seed. Then we put down cardboard and then we put down mulch, put it all in place. And the benefit of that too, is that it smothers all the grass out and that becomes part of what's decomposing into this really rich soil. Um, the way that nature obviously gets a lot of the nitrogen into that system is with animals. And just to tell you another story from Elk Run Farm, the pilot farm of the nonprofit, when Nick got to that place, there was a whole big flat area that had been used as a parking lot. It had even road base on it, super compacted, super dead. And he decided he wanted to get pigs and he thought, you know, they can't possibly make this land any worse than it already is, so I'm going to put them there. And then he started throwing in wood chips and manure. And what he noticed was the pigs were starting to actually turn that through, eat the grubs, dig it into the ground, and topsoil was building. So they decided to actually plant a crop there. They went to Masa Seed Foundation and they asked for the most drought resilient crops that they had, staple crops. They came back with a number of corns and beans to try and mostly they did pretty terribly, but they saved the seed from what actually did grow and planted that the next year. And what's happened now seven years in is that they have rotations of crops, pigs, chickens. The pigs come and knock down all the crops and start turning them into the soil. The chickens come and add their fertility. The pigs and the chickens are fed with compost scraps that would otherwise go to landfill. And this is what's happened to the soil in that time. On the bottom left is a comparison of the next soil next door that's still in driveway state and the soil as it looks in those crop fields. It's about seven inches deep with over 20% soil organic matter. And this is what the corn looks like there now, irrigated only into the beginning of June and then dry land the whole rest of the season because they run out of water. So just a potent example of how we can actually combine our, our animal and cropping systems to build topsoil really quite rapidly um, rather than keeping those things separate and the inefficiencies of hauling all of that around. This is one of my favorite Bill Mollison quotes. <clears throat> you don't have a snail problem, you have a duck deficiency. And I bet some of you actually saw the biggest little farm, which did a beautiful job of illustrating this because basically they had their ducks that were in the pond and their poop was causing a major algal bloom situation. While meanwhile in their orchard, slugs were completely overrunning the fruit crops and destroying the trees. And they realized that the solution was actually to bring the ducks into that orchard. And now the pond salt problem is solved and the ducks are having a heyday eating those slugs. 
And again, just speaking to this quality in permaculture that solutions are additive. And also the problem is the solution. That's another favorite mantra. Um, this is again, the forest garden at my homestead. And the way that I integrate ducks into it is basically they have their little pond. Every day I move that pond and I use the water to water the plants around it. And then I move it to the next guild and then the next guild. So that is the only irrigation system there. The mulch is dense enough, it acts as a sponge. And then the ducks roam around pooping on all that carbon, helping it break down and eating pests. Um, another principle here is use and value renewables. I have to just show this because building with cob is one of the most fun things we do in the permaculture course every year. I don't know if any of you have gotten a chance to do this, but basically you're mixing clay and sand and straw and water in the right proportions and you're stomping it and rolling it. And it's a super interactive, fun activity. And what's amazing about these materials is they're so cheap, so easy to source um, and so fun to build with. And down on the right here is the, the composting toilet that we built at my homestead this year, this past year. It was such a beautiful synchronicity because it happened that I was really excited to try burying a refrigerator as a root cellar, um, which is a somewhat successful experiment. But anyway, we took out a huge amount of this clay subsoil. Then we pruned all of these branches out of the fruit food forest um, and had all these branches lying around. And what we ended up doing was weaving all those sticks together for the siding of these walls and then doing cob over them. So just working with what we had, all we had to bring into the system was some sand. Um, and then again, use small, slow solutions. Actually, I'm gonna pose this as a question to you. Why should we use small, slow solutions instead of big, fast solutions? If you're anything like me, this is probably the most annoying principle for you because there's so much that needs to happen in the world right now. Um, anyone wanna type an answer to that? Ripple effects, which are unintended, see the mistakes early. They replicate nature. Gives you time to observe and correct because I don't have a lot of time and money. All amazing answers. And really what I've come to notice over time is how this is really the most essential principle for particularly the reason you mentioned that it gives us time to actually observe and interact which is another principle to accept the feedback that we're getting. When we all act independently in a small, slow way, we're able to actually create a lot of change, but always with the ability to buffer and adjust and, and really see the impact that we're having, which is much harder to do when we're moving big and fast. Um, and in this people-centric way that also allows us to use the time and energy that we do have. And then our final principle I just wanted to highlight here is obtain a yield. And I think in a way, this has been the biggest paradigm shift for me over the last decade and for many of us in this world. And I get a lot of pushback on this because when I talk about these ecosystems that we're building through an agricultural lens, I do find that a lot of people are saying, oh, but you're not using all natives. Restoration doesn't mean building a new thing. It means putting back what was there before this kind of native restoration angle. And what I'm slowly realizing is wild spaces are absolutely essential and what we ha have, we need to keep, but it speaks to this division that's in our minds that humans aren't part of nature. Nature's over here and humans are over here. And if we can design new types of ecosystems that actually include humans, but also support biodiversity and sequester carbon and restore hydrological cycles, we get to now participate again in something that not only is a massive solution for our really degraded agricultural lands, but is also just genuinely bringing us joy. I don't think there's anything more joyful for me than participating in my own subsistence with people. And so again, just speaking to this opportunity that we have through permaculture to create new types of ecosystems that we get to be a keystone species again, but we're not the only ones there or the only ones driving it. Some of the greatest beauty is when, for example, a bird lands in the cherry tree I planted and poops out a current that I never planted, and now that's in the ecosystem. Um, so just wanted to end on that note. And with this wonderful quote by Albert Einstein that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. 
Um, and just in case anyone's interested, I just did want to mention the course that we teach, per local permaculture course that's held at a combination of all of these sites one weekend a month from April through October. We are still open for registration, pretty close to being full, um, but I just wanted to share this info in case anyone's interested in diving deeper into permaculture design. We cover all of these topics in more detail along with more of the design process. Um, so happy to take any questions about that later as well. Um, but I know we have just about 10 minutes left here and wanna open it up for questions from the audience as well. Perfect, thank you so much, Amy. That was amazing, so inspiring. Um, everyone in attendance, if you have questions, please leave them in the chat. I have a couple of my own that we can start off with and they're just a couple that we've gotten throughout. Um, that presentation was so engaging. So people I think were <laughs> very um, engaged in the discussion rather than writing out their questions. So feel free to do that now. Um, but I'll start off, we got one question um, going back to your herb spiral. Someone asked how you create that. Do you build and plant the center first and then move outwards? Or do you have a specific te technique for that? Yeah, so I might not be the best person to ask about that. I kind of cobbled mine together by piling up dirt and mashing bricks into the side of it until the whole thing held together well enough. But there are definitely um, more long-term <laughs> and enduring structures that one could create. I would say that probably um, a couple of the other instructors, Avery Ellis and Patrick Patton, do a lot more of the residential hardscaping design and would be good people to ask for a more how-to on that. I just cobbled mine together. All right, <laughs> no worries. Mm -hmm. um, oh gosh, okay, we've got a lot of questions all of a sudden. Um, I will try to go through these in order. Um, how many calories can you produce using these techniques or how much of your diet do you think permaculture has the potential to um, produce? Yeah, so two answers to that question. Um, from a practical case study standpoint, one of the things that completely overawes me about Elk Run Farm is they have a third of an acre irrigated forest garden, about a third of an acre grain fields, and then that 10 acre dryland agroforestry system. They are 90% food self-sufficient for over 10 people year round. It's a level of self-sufficiency that I have not seen elsewhere. Um, it includes all the staple crops, all the calories. They basically buy rice and certain condiments for that community and do a huge amount of preservation. So as a case study, the amount of people eating off a really small amount of land is amazing. I get this pushback a lot just from a numbers question of like, this is great, but permaculture can't feed the world. So I did this math once and I said, okay, imagine you have an apple tree and imagine you have that exact same area as that apple tree, same kind of circular area planted in potatoes, which are the most calorie dense crop that humans can grow as an annual here. Which of those do you think has the greater yield? And the answer is it's almost exactly the same. But then when you think of the apple tree and what it's providing that the potatoes don't, you plant it once, much more drought resilient, creates habitat, sequesters carbon, is building its own fertility, and you have a whole understory that you can plant under it as well that's also edible. So that jumps the yield way over the potatoes. And so to me, that's just a literal example. But if anyone wants a really beautiful case study that gets into this more, um, Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard, that's the guy with the 110 acre farm, goes into this in a lot more detail and basically shows that these systems are vastly more productive of both calories and nutrition. They're just harder to manage within the monoculture farm systems that we have now. Totally. Oh, that's an amazing answer. That's, I think, one that I struggled with a lot. So I'm glad you could answer it. Um, next question. I know nitrogen restoration is a big topic of conversation that I hear a lot about. Is phosphorus similar? Hmm. That's interesting. I've never heard the phrase nitrogen restoration before. I guess I'm assuming that that just means replenishing nitrogen levels in the soil. And I know we do talk a lot about nitrogen fixing plants and such. Um, I guess the thing that's coming to mind as an answer right away is that if you're using animal-based fertility, it's all in there together. Manures have nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. So almost if you're building for one, you're building for another. Um, and most of the fertility building that I'm familiar with is involving animal systems. 
Um, I don't, yeah, that's my short answer. I don't know if I have more than that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm gonna probably butcher the pronunciation of this, but um, they asked, they're interested to hear if you incorporate hugel culture into your soil building techniques. Yeah, and just for those who may not know, hugel culture basically involves burying wood, either like in a berm or in ground. And the idea is as it decomposes, it holds a lot of water that it can then release back to the system, as well as fungal life and all sorts of goodies. I did that in Virginia. I actually don't do it very often in this climate because most of my systems are so dry that the amount of water it takes to even start jump starting that process is more than I'm using. So I have not found it to be the most helpful thing for this climate, but if you were in a high water or irrigated situation, it may be, is my take on it. Awesome, okay. Um, next question, any other resources you would recommend for quote backyard homesteaders who may not have access to all of the elements that make up a permaculture farm? Yeah, so thing one, there's no right elements. In a way, permaculture design is looking at what is possible in your space and what are your goals. So there's not like things that you, you have to have um, to make it a permaculture site. So no pressure on that account. <laughs> um, but some of the good kind of backyard books, Gaia's Garden is a very popular one for backyard homesteaders. Um, I know Nick from the nonprofit raves about Dave Jackie's Forest Gardens, which is also a small scale thing. I personally have absorbed most of this on the ground rather than by reading it, so I'm not always the best person to ask for book things, but I would highly recommend just going to Elkron Farm if you can, because it is small scale, actually, the forest garden there. Perfect, okay. Um, <laughs> someone wants to hear more about how you buried a refrigerator and used it as a root cellar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did get that idea from somewhere. I can't remember where um, it was mentioned to me at some point. And I just happened to come across a free refrigerator that was actually from that um, Crane Hollow Cafe in Hygiene when it closed. So anyway, I took it. And what we ended up doing was getting all the refrigerator parts out of it. And then we sunk it and we put a little ventilator. It almost looks like a submarine so that there's airflow, but then otherwise literally just submerged it in the ground with the idea that the temperature is gonna stay pretty stable down there. And I do insulate it with straw bales over winter, but so far it hasn't dropped below 28 in, in there. So it's been quite effective and I'm using it at the moment to store all of the seed potatoes um, over winter and the root crops, although we ate a lot of them already, but yeah. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, someone is wondering, what is known about Kearns's tendency or not to form monocultures? Mm -hmm. um, and they said, what's motivating this question is that they live on property that has a lot of non-native smooth brome that has displaced a diversity of native forbs and grasses. Yeah. I so sympathize with the smooth brome thing. We have that on a lot of our lands as well, and it does totally smother out diversity. Um, unlike smooth brome, Kernza is a bunch grass, and it's such a new thing. People are still experimenting with it, but I know there's been a lot of effort to interplant it with alfalfa, and we're actually going to try interplanting it with native wildflowers and see if we can actually create a more prairie-like um, diverse habitat with it that way. It's very closely related to our native wheat grasses, which do not have a monoculture forming tendency. They're pretty integrated into our diverse prairie ecosystems. And so from that standpoint, um, less concern about it being a, becoming a monoculture than the brome for sure. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay, we're getting to the end here. So I'm gonna pick like one or two more questions. Um, really quick, someone, wants to replace their lawn, yay, do it. Um, <laughs> what is a three sisters equivalent that might be feasible on that kind of space? And sorry, I might need a clarification if- I think that was- want a perennial version of the three sisters or just that, because you could, um, depending on your lawn size, probably could do the three sisters. I, I was reading it as a less like agriculture focused, food production focused and more like, mm -hmm flowers or something you might want in like a front yard, but I, I could be wrong on that. So I'll just say there's a lot of options for companion plants and I, I, there's so many 
questions, I can't give you a specific answer, but if you can look at just the varied root system, plant family, but similar growing conditions thing, you can design those quite easily. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that more with more info, but. Okay, um, last question. Sorry guys, I know we have a lot of questions here, but um, what do you do to control invasive weeds and or grasses on your land? Um, the short answer in a way is I don't. I see them as part of that natural process of ecological succession. And my experience has been that as we build the soil and bring in more woody material, they just leave. We used to have a lot in the vegetable garden, we don't anymore. It's kind of progressed through that ecological succession piece. When we aren't redisturbing the ground, it doesn't reseed itself because things are already there. I know people are a little horrified by the amount of bindweed that's growing in my forest garden. I like it. I literally think that it's a living ground cover. It's not out competing anything. It's creating moisture, it's creating shade. I see bugs on those flowers. My pigs absolutely love it. If you actually wanna get rid of bindweed, by the way, the pigs will dig it out of the whole top foot of the soil and eat it with delight. It's their favorite thing. There's no rototiller that can do that. But I guess all that to say, I'm seeing them as part of the ecosystem and I'm treating them as colonizers and I'm grateful that they're there and they're, they're leaving as the system becomes more developed. Awesome. <laughs> People have a lot to say about that. One. <laughs> um, they, seem, they seem pretty excited about your response. <laughs> um, we are going to wrap up now, guys, because we are at the top of the hour. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Um, we will have this posted again if you want to rewatch anything um, in a follow up email. But thank you again to Amy for being here and presenting. That was so inspiring. People are very excited about this one. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. All right, have a good rest of your day, everyone.